Today's gospel reading comes from Luke chapters 12, verses 49 through 53. Jesus said, I came to cast fire on the earth, and would that it were already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Do you think I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. For from now on, in one house, there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. This is the word of the Lord. Good luck with that one. Oh my goodness. <laughs> what is going on? Is that from the Bible? Are you sure? Good gracious almighty. Uh, what is going on with the gospel this morning? Jesus is supposed to be a gatherer, a uniter, uh, the prince of peace. And all of a sudden there's fire coming down and, uh, you know, all of that. What is that? Does it sound like good news? That sounds like bad news. I came down to cast fire on the earth and I wish it was already blazing you think I just came for peace but I came to divide families mother against daughter-in-law and father-in-law against son what in the world is going on I'm shocked I'm shocked is this good news or bad news Oh, the scene in which Jesus is saying this, these red letters of your New Testament gospel. He's preaching to people who have moved far away from God. They think they're righteous, but they're really not. And they hear God's word and they are upset about it all through the gospels. Jesus' words were like a, a lightning rod for the people. The people had become arrogant and set in their ways. The church couldn't hear the words of the Savior. The church had moved away from its roots. And the church was definitely not aligned with its true purpose. And Jesus called them out on it. Newcomers and people that were humble had no problem accepting Jesus' message. It was much easier for them to see the truth and adjust. They had no real investment in this ego-type church that had formed. They were open to criticism. They were willing to see themselves as God truly saw them. They didn't see themselves as better than they were. I will have to say, I understand this church of I'm better than everyone else. I get it. It's hard to be humbled. Nobody wants to be put in their place. Jesus came onto the scene like a lightning rod. And the church of God's chosen people wasn't ready to fully embrace the truth. I see that today. Don't you? The church has a terrible time with criticism. We don't want to be exposed and we don't want our weaknesses to come out in the open. And in this season of extreme arrogance that we live in, in our culture, in our regular society, what most statisticians will tell us is that the church is decreasing in numbers. That's what all the research says. Less and less people are attending church. Church attendance is one of the least popular sports on Sunday, and it used to be number one. Any thoughts on why? 
You don't have to answer that. <laughs> it's a rhetorical question, but in your mind, think about it. Why do you think? Maybe it's time to take a self-evaluation. There is uh, probably no more humbling sport than the sport of golf. Uh, I don't know if they told you, but golf is very, very hard. Do you know that already? Yeah? So much so that, um, as many of you know, I have avoided golf for 52 years of my life. <laughs> we used to go to Top Golf, but it became the pastor uh, comedy show, and so we don't go anymore because it's so ridiculous. But I looked in the mirror last week and I said, come on, you big baby. Nearly all your friends play golf. Almost your entire parishioner congregation plays golf. Uh, yeah, there are parishioners on the golf course listening to this maybe. Kevin Smith, hopefully you're still up. Um, and all my pastors in my circuit they all play golf, all of them. But Pastor Dax has never played a round of golf until today. We're, my wife and I have both never played and we're going for the first time today. So anyway, well, I did it. Last week I did it. I, I went on eBay and I bought a golf club. <laughs> Here it is, right? <laughs> And I took a pic, I was so proud. I took a picture of it and, and I sent it out to my uh, golfing um, parishioner, and, uh, golfing friends and parishioner buddies. Okay, by the way, I have to say this disclaimer. Um, this sermon is not really about golf. Uh, like many of you, you might be kind of bored with this, uh, like my wife is right now. And uh, you might nod off. I'm asking you, don't nod off because it's very symbolic of another thing, which is coming. So just to do that disclaimer. But anyway, I sent the picture out to my parishioner friends and I've got the craziest responses. They were like, throw that thing away before you hurt yourself, was one of the texts. Uh, another one was, are you nuts? That, uh, uh, that club is smaller than the ball. Uh, man, I, what did, I thought I was getting in touch with the roots of golf. My favorite one was, don't send that back. It's not worth the shipping. And whatever you do, don't donate it to Goodwill so some other sucker gets stuck with that club. It's like, oh, come on. I thought I was getting back to the roots of golf, this 1950s Ben Hogan antique club. Woods are supposed to be woods, not titanium alloy. I thought I was doing a good thing. Oh my gosh. I thought I was getting back in touch with the sacredness of golf. What makes golf special? I was going back to the roots. What I realized when I dug a little bit into the, you know, golf world and I dug deeper and, and started to research it, you know what I found out? Golf is on the decline, heavily on the decline. Golf is a sport that is literally dying. There are more golfers that are dying than are picking up the sport. Golf is having a big problem. The PGA Tour is losing viewers. Did you know that? If it wasn't for Tiger Woods, nobody would pay attention to golf. Golfers don't watch golf. I found that out too. That's fascinating. I decided to go to the source. I said to myself, you know what? I'm gonna go visit the PGA store in Fairfax and I'm gonna ask some questions. So I did a little field trip and I went in and I met with a consultant and I said, I'm new to golf, aren't you glad to see me? And they took me over to the putting area, which is right next to the door when you first come in. And I was like, where are the putters? You know, I'm thinking like a little dog leg putter, the old school. And I'm looking over there, they look like little mini vacuum cleaners. 
You know, they're like these big, huge, and there's welts for balance, and it makes it so much easier. You barely have to swing, and it goes for you. And I'm like, what fun is that? So then they take me to this room, and they call it the driving range room. I'm like, this is a small room for, like, driving. Oh, it's crazy. They have projectors that project onto the screen, and, and, you, and you swing into this, like, movie theater screen and then they measure how far you hit it and how fast your swing was and you know I'm in there and they're telling me about hybrids and drivers and irons I'm all confused I'm getting disoriented and and I'm trying to swing to move your elbow and your wrist and your arm and your leg and you know look down and I was all I was like there's a lot of rules for golf this is becoming not so fun and at that moment Rod Sterling steps out from the darkness, smoking a cigarette, and he says, Pastor Dax has stepped into a golf store, but actually he has stepped into the twilight zone. And at that mo moment, my mind just opened up and I thought, oh, this is like church. This is what it feels like to come into church for the first time. Stand up, sit down, say this, say that. All of this stuff technology and all these things that we're so dependent on. And I thought to myself, oh, wow, we're both in the same boat. I got in my car, I drove home. I started to think about all these parallels between the problems with golf and the problems with today's church and the similar decline for the similar reasons. And I won't go into all the parallels because uh, my wife is already bored. She's like, oh, we're talking about golf again. Oh, geez. All right. Anyway, um, I, I went through and um, I sort of thought about all of the parallels. And it made me think, oh, my goodness. Has church been too technologically dependent, too growth dependent? to attendance on Sunday morning dependent, less about the real close bonds and fellowship among the people. Have we stopped including people in our lives that aren't already our friends and aren't already like us? Man, I wish he would have left that line out of the sermon. I learned so much from my golf experience about church. Golf is the one and only sport that's whole purpose is fellowship. It's designed around fellowship. It's the only sport where you can play somebody 10 times better than you and have an even game because of the handicap system. Golf is a sport where you show up at a country club to play golf and you're paired with someone you don't even know. That happened to you yesterday, right? Yeah. It's amazing. Do people know how beautiful this game is? Or does everyone outside of the sport think they're not good enough to be inside of the sport? And the people inside of the sport aren't helping with that problem. We're not talking about golf anymore, are we? Jesus came to help the church extend the fellowship. His fellowship, his inclusion of all people into the family of God. All people, not just your friends, not just the people you like, not just your equals. People who can barely swing a club, metaphorically speaking. Not everyone was on board with this new future of the church. Family members split over what Jesus' good news was all about, about what his New Testament of the living God brought to the scene. The rules didn't change, they're still the same. The hearts of the people changed because of what Christ did. The cross that our 
Lord took on himself, that he alludes to by that baptism comment, changed the world. It brought us together. Many of us in this room probably never would meet if it wasn't for Jesus. Jesus brought us together as a family through the Lord's handicap system, adjusted for redeemed sinners at various levels. That's what makes the church beautiful. That's what makes the church function as it should. So let's take this gospel message. Let's take this good news into the world. The blessing that we have been given. And include people in our fellowship. Amen?